Well, I love a good challenge. Anybody else like a good challenge? Yeah, well, my son was just telling me about this interesting challenge. He's a big uh, YouTuber, and uh, he saw this challenge that this guy started with a cup of sand, and he traded it up, and his goal is to get a Tesla. He, he <laughs> traded it for a dollar, and then he bought something else with that dollar of more value, and he kept going up and up and up, and he's at, actually at a point now where he's got over $20,000. And he's almost to the point where he's going to get a test. What a cool challenge that would be to do. Uh, every so often in my news feed, when, I, when I'm reading the news, I see an ad that pops up. You know, this is how you should invest $1,000. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that. Where, where's a good investment for $1,000? It reminded me of eight years ago in our church, I took $1,000 of our money. Uh, this was over and above our tithe. This was an offering, and I took $1,000, and I, and I got $20 bills, and I put them in 50 envelopes. And I had this plan, because I was preaching that Sunday, on what it means to be a missionary. And my plan was is that when the time came for the offering, I would do a reverse offering. I would instruct the ushers, and they went, and they passed out the, uh, the offering, as the, we used to pass the baskets, and they would go around... And inside the basket were 50 envelopes, each with $20 bills. And I told everyone, go ahead, take out an envelope. Take money out of the offering basket. And I watched, because I wanted to see who was comfortable doing that. <laughs> Thankfully, nobody was. And uh, they took one out, and then I said, no, you need to go be a blessing to someone, like a missionary would. And look for the opportunity to share the gospel, the good news about Jesus with them. And it was interesting, kind of looking at their faces. They were a little uncomfortable with it, but they did. I assured them God wanted them to do this. And um, a lot of them went out and were, were just looking for opportunities to bless someone, praying, you know, God, show me who you want me to give this $20 to, or, or buy somebody coffee or lunch or something like that. And everybody that participated, told me that, man, this was awesome. You know, they felt like they were being a missionary. And I told them, you know, just, just tell them whatever you need to tell them. If you have to tell them, my pastor told me I have to do this, <laughs> tell them that. All right, but, but just go do it. And they enjoyed it. And I will tell you personally, that's the best $1,000 investment that I've ever done. Because it got our, it got you out there being like a missionary, looking for opportunities to bless someone. Do you know what Jesus meant when he said, store up treasures in heaven? When you think about investing your money, do you pray about it and wonder, how would God want me to do this? How would God want me to invest this? Do you see your money as your money or God's money? Today, we're at this point in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talks about money. And he talks about challenges you how you see your money. Questions, in fact, your motive for giving. And he demands total loyalty to God. I'm telling you, this isn't a sermon to get you to give more to this church. It's not a sermon to make you feel guilty so you'll give more to this church. I don't preach those sermons. I never have and I never will. Because I don't need to. I don't need to. And you'll see why. This is about seeing money the way God intended you to see it. It's about managing God's money as a good steward. It's about getting to heaven and realizing I have a lot of treasures because of what I invested when I was on, at, in, at home or at, in, on earth. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve. God and money. Will you pray with me? Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for us, saving us so that we have eternal life, that we have a way to heaven. <clears throat> Father, while we are here on this earth, will you help us to understand and, and see money properly? Help us to not be consumed by it. Let it not captivate our heart. But God, let us serve you let us love you. Help us to love you 
with all our heart. Not part of our heart, all of our heart. And God, as we listen about this message on what you, you had to say on that Sermon on the Mount, let us apply it to our lives so that we are changed. We are changing you more like you, made in your image. In Jesus' name, and the whole church said. Amen. Amen. So I asked you at the beginning of the year to read seven books. Four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can read over and over again, the Gospels. And the other three are written by Christian authors. One's called Not a Fan, the other one's called Heaven, and the last one is the one I'm referencing now. It's called The Treasure Principle. Just a little booklet, probably could read it in a couple hours, The Treasure Principle. The reason why I like the treasure principle is because it talks about the truths that I'm going to share with you today that come from the teaching of Jesus. And I think sometimes you hear a sermon and it's life changing. Sometimes you read a book and it's life changing. Sometimes you get both, like today. <laughs> so I hope it's life changing for you. We open up our Bibles if you have them. Uh, we always offer a free Bible on the back table there by the couch. If you'd like to take home a Bible with you, you're welcome to have one. But if you don't have your Bible, we'll have it up on the screen, I think. Um, Matthew, we start in chapter 6, verse 19. Jesus said these words, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. I just love that, don't you? I mean, it's where your treasure is, your heart will be also. That just tells us so much. Have you ever had something really valuable stolen from you? Not sentimental. Like valuable, like worth a lot of money. Isn't it? Has that ever gone missing? Somebody stole it from you? How did you react to that? Because your reaction to that really shows if you were attached to your possession. How are you when you react to that? Did you just lose your mind like there was so much money and so on? Or did you just kind of shrug it off and say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think your reaction shows your heart. It helps you see your heart. If something's gone, if something breaks, if something just its not there anymore, how do you react to it? Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. If you invest in a stock, you pay attention to it, right? If you invest in your kids to play a sport, you make sure they get to practice into the games. If you buy a house, oh boy, that's the tip of the iceberg, man. <laughs> then there's got you know, curtains and rugs and dishes, oh my, right? I mean, there's, there's everything. <laughs> when you spend your money on stuff, it's important to you because where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Now, it's perfectly fine to buy things. God doesn't say you can't buy things. You can't have possessions. doesn't say that. Christian life isn't about, you know, not buying anything. Earthly possessions are not the problem unless they captivate your heart. Unless they capture your heart. Unless they steer you away from God. No one can serve two masters, Jesus says, can't serve God in money because you'll despise the one, right? And you'll love the other. But maybe you're here today and money really isn't your God. You don't have a problem with that. But maybe it's your job that's your God. Or maybe it's your significant other or a relationship or a lifestyle. Anything that takes your heart away from God, it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be dealt with. Today we're talking about money because Jesus talked about it. And if you're wondering, maybe, huh, maybe I wonder, do I serve money? Is that, is that my feeling? Do I serve money? Do I see money the way God wants me to see it? How do I know? How do I know the answer to that? I think there's many Christians that serve money and don't even realize it. I mean, it, you can be a Christian and still serve money. But God wants you to know that you shouldn't do that. How do I know that there are many Christians that serve money? Statistics. You know what statistics are? The average Christian gives 2 to 3% of their income. 2 to 3%. 
That's not giving. That's an insulting tip. Think about it. What if you tipped your waitress 2 to 3 percent? What an insult. Giving 2 to 3 percent shows that a lot of Christians don't see money the way God wants them to see it because if you did, you would be storing up treasures in heaven, as Jesus taught. But you, my friends, I know this church, you're not like most Christians. You're extraordinary. You, you give faithfully, you give cheerfully. And the more we give, the more we see people coming to life of purpose, getting closer to God. When people come to life of purpose, they will get the word of God. They'll get the truth in God's word that's taught here every week. And you'll get to be with people that love you, that are genuine. You know, there's times where I get a little stressed out about how the order of service or the, the, the transitions in the service or the noise. Because ultimately, my, my hope is on a Sunday morning is that there would not be any distractions for you to worship God. That is my ultimate goal as the leader, one of the leaders of this church, is that I want you to be able to come on a Sunday morning and worship God distraction-free. And sometimes I can't control that because sometimes you've got things going on in your life that are distracting you. But at least I can try to do my part and, and have things go smoothly. But I love the fact that we are a church that, you know what, if something happens, nobody gets uh, their panties in a bunch, as they say. All right? You're okay with it. You know, if a, if a baby starts crying, all right, I'm just going to preach a little loud, okay? It's not going to be a distraction for me. So it's a good thing, all right? We don't have to be all rigid and sit in our seats and think that the, No, we're here to worship God, amen? Amen. And I, and I love that we can do that. So you keep doing what you're doing because when you give faithfully and cheerfully, we get to do this. We get to help people get closer to God and lives are changing. I see it every single Sunday. So we want to store up, continue to store up our treasures in heaven and we can be extravagant, extravagant givers because we don't serve two masters. We serve God. But I want you to see what the scripture teaches us, what God's word teaches us about people who serve money. I'm going to give you four kind of signs that this is what people do when they serve money. First of all, they give with strings attached. They give to get. We look at this, uh, we see this in Matthew chapter 6, just a little bit earlier. Jesus talks about these people that were giving. Uh, joining the church is not like joining the gym. You don't give your tithe so you can get something in return. All right? Uh, there are lots of people in churches today that do that. They're big givers, so they feel like they're power players and they want to say in everything. No, that's the elders of the church are the ones who are leading the church. So anyway, Matthew 6, verse 2, Jesus said this, When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. If you've ever been to Mongolian barbecue, you know there's this big giant symbol where the cooks do their thing. You put a, some money in the tip jar, and you get to bang that thing, and it's loud, and the, cheer, the cheers, the, the cooks cheer, because you just gave them money, and you just got your reward. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's your reward when you give to get. And that's the kind of giving that people do when they serve money. Secondly, when you serve money, you covet. What does it mean to covet? I take it Exodus 20, verse 17. Exodus 20. It's actually the 10th commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet your uh, neighbor's servants or his ox or his donkey or anything else that is your neighbor's. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was pulling in after some time out on the water fishing with my boat that's 20 years old. It's a 2000, going on 21 years. And I was pulling in 11 mile 
and uh, the launch there, and I saw a brand new Crestliner. 1850 fish hawk with 115 horsepower on it. Beautiful boat. Just the kind that I'm saving up for. <laughs> Boy, was it hard not to covet that boat. But you know what? I don't covet it. And I don't covet it for two ways. Here's how I don't covet it. Number one, I don't stare at it. If you see me pulling in at 11 mile, you'll probably see me doing this from now on the rest of the year. So I don't stare at that red beauty. The windshield and the rod holders and all the other ones. I also, here's the key, I give thanks for the boat I have. I'm actually content with the boat I have. I like it. It gets me where I want to go. I can do what I have to do. I'm content. When people serve money, they're not content. They're never satisfied. They will always come. Thirdly, um, I have a little clip that I want to show you here, and I'll set it up here before we hit play, but it's a commercial that I saw a long time ago, and so I found it, and I, I recorded it, and I'm not um, promoting the, the, the company that put the commercial out, um, which pops up at the end, but I just wanted you to see the commercial because when you see it, it's going to make you laugh. I know it is. Um, but so let's let's watch this quick commercial. I'm Stephanie Johnson. I've got a great family. I've got a four bedroom house and a great community. Like my car? It's new. I need to belong to the local golf club. Because you're a slave to it. Proverbs 22.7 tells us that the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. I always wonder sometimes how people can drive around in brand new cars, have these big houses, have boats and all the toys, and yet they probably make the same amount of money I do. And I'm thinking to myself, how is that possible? And then I saw this commercial and I'm like, that's it. <laughs> They're in debt to their eyeballs. They're a slave to debt. Debt is not God's plan for you. In fact, I love this. As my wife and I, uh, when we um, made our way out of debt uh, many years uh, ago, we um, love this verse, Romans 13, 8. It says, Oh, no one, anything, except the debt to love one another. Just love that. How much debt should you be in? Well, just the debt to love one another. Because then you fulfill the law. When people serve money, they end up usually in debt. And lastly, they look down on poor people. When people serve money, they look down on poor people. In this Sermon on the Mount, this famous sermon that Jesus preached, he said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And then he said these two verses that if you read them, you probably got a little confused. I'll read them to you now. Verse 22, he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? <laughs> that last part gets a little confusing, doesn't it? What is Jesus saying here? He's saying that your eye determines if you're good or evil. Your view of the world. How you see other people and other things. You see, in Proverbs 28, 22, it says, a stingy man. Now, just look at that for a second, because stingy is our translation of the Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word is actually a word that means a man whose eye is evil. Isn't that interesting? A man whose eye is evil. See, the eye was a way of kind of, um, you know, the, the beginning of or the gateway to the soul. Like, this is who you are as a person, from your eye. The eye who's... The man who has an evil eye, a stingy man, he hastens, he anxiously hurries after wealth, and he doesn't know poverty will come upon him. But then I'll give you a little bit deeper into the scripture. 
uh, back in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 through 9, the Israelites, God's people, had a way of living, and they had something every seven years where they forgave the debt. Whoever borrowed money from them, they forgave them on the seventh year. So here in verse 7, it says, if any, um, um, if any of you, um, if among you, one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within, now get this, your land that the Lord your God is giving you. Who gave them the land? God. God. Like they have what they have because of God. You shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother. But you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. So I'm sure they thought, okay, that's fine. <coughs> Excuse me. They can loan to their brother in need. But get this. It says in verse 9. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart. If you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother. And you give him nothing, and he cries out to the Lord against you, and be guilty of sin. So God had established a system that in the seventh year you had to forgive all those who owed you money. If someone came to you in year six, one month before the forgiveness year, and said, hey man, I need a big loan. How are you going to look at them? Right? How are you going to look at them? How are you going to just give freely? Because knowing that in one month, you're going to have to forgive what you just loaned them. The only way you can do it is if you have a good eye and not an evil eye. It's only how you see what you have. Did it come from God? If it does, you give freely. You have no problem giving freely. It's not mine anyway. It's God's. God says, give it. I'm going to give it. People have no problem when they serve God, helping a brother in need. But this is the result. This is the reality of people who serve money. They give to get. They covet. They have lots of debt. And they look down on poor people. Why God wants you to serve Him only? Why does God want you to serve Him only? Because money never makes you happy. Anybody tried that when you were younger? <laughs> Anybody still trying it? I hope you figure it out before it's kind of too late and messes things up. The key to happiness really is managing God's money as a good steward, faithfully. Because God owns it all, He's blessed you with it, and He wants you to use it for His purposes. So you store up treasures in heaven. You invest in his kingdom. In Texas, the town of Houston is named after a guy named Sam Houston. Lived a long time ago. He kind of lived a tumultuous life, but eventually he was baptized as a believer, like Jesus, by immersion. And at that time, you knew his life changed because he chose to give or to pay for half of the minister's salary each year. And they asked him, why? Why would you do that? And he said, because God baptized my wallet too. <laughs> you might have heard of this guy, Alfred Nobel. He made a fortune with dynamite. Did you know that in 1888 his brother died? And the newspaper mixed up the brothers and reported that Alfred died with the headline, The Merchant of Death is Dead. Yeah, that's what they called him. Grief stricken by his own brother's death, but also with how the world saw him, he decided to change his legacy. Upon his death eight years later, he left $9 million, an incredible sum back then, to a fund that would benefit humanity. They are known today as the Nobel Peace Prizes. He invested in godly things. Around the same time as Alfred Nobel was George Mueller, one of my heroes. Not Ferris Bueller, you're my hero. George Mueller. 
He's my hero. Because he ran an orphanage in Bristol, England. And he never once asked people for money. But the orphanage was ran on total donations. Christians giving to it. But he never asked people for money. Instead, he prayed. And there were times he wrote that they would sit down at the dinner table with all the orphans and they would be praying for God to provide. And there was no food on the table. And then a donation would come. And they would go out and buy bread and have food to eat at the last minute. All because they trusted in God. I believe those donations came from people like you and me. Think about it. There were people all over the world who knew about the orphanage, knew about George Mueller. He never asked them for the money, but he was praying for it. And the God who is everywhere was in the orphanage as well as people's homes around the world. And as they sat down and they prayed, God, I want to invest in your kingdom. How can I do that? How can I store up treasures in heaven? God put it on their heart to the Holy Spirit to send a donation to the orphanage to help those families, or to help those children. And that's how it happened. I think when you sit down and you pray and you ask God to speak to your heart, He can do the same thing. He can speak to your heart. This is why I said earlier, I don't need to preach sermons to guilt you into giving. I don't need to do that. Because I trust that your giving will come from your heart. A heart that only serves God. You might know Joshua. He led God's people after Moses. And when they conquered that promised land, when they were enjoying an abundance, he told the people, fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness, put away your foreign gods, and choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, what did he say? Serve the Lord. That's right. So as uh, Bobby and Naomi come up for our final song, I want to encourage you to choose this day whom you will serve. You cannot serve God and money. Amen.